Create and execute Windows command files. Search text files. This video shows how to search text files for user entered values. The code example provides a framework for the user to develop code to manage text files. The following videos will show how to provide the file management functions of retrieving, adding, or modifying data from text files. For the file management functions, this code will be converted to a user callable function. You are watching a Tom's Tech Notes video. If you like this video, please wait until you are finished watching it, then click my name, Thomas Wallace, to visit my channel page. A welcome video will play to describe my other videos. We'll do a code walkthrough, including programming tips. The sample text file uses a comma delimiter. The code contains debug code, which can be disabled with a flag or can be removed from your final code. It also contains code that checks for user input errors, which we'll see as we walk through the code. Please note how the debug and error check code works. You may want to add similar code to your own coding projects. I'm a firm believer in Murphy's Law. For those of you who weren't programming in the 60s, that means what can go wrong will go wrong. The next video will show you how to modify this code to process CSV files exported from the Gmail context page. Parameters that need to be changed for each project are listed near the top, so they're easy to find. This first instruction was discussed in earlier videos and it sets the current directory to the directory containing the batch file. It's only necessary if you execute the batch file from a shortcut. If you execute the batch file by clicking on its icon or its file name, the current directory will automatically be set to the path to the batch file, which is the folder path. Here's the code that sets the defaults and that the defaults will be overridden if the test flag is set and we'll see that in a second. This is the file name for the project that the main project and it sets the token count to three that means that the each record of the file will contain, contain three pieces of information separated by commas. If you want to work with a file that doesn't have any separation, you want to read the whole record into one variable, all you have to do is delete this comma, but don't put a space there. Then it'll read the entire line in one chunk, and you can process that chunk. Here's some of the test code. Set test flag equals yes. So if you change this line, that will turn the test code off. When it's turned on, it sets a test file name of temp.txt. See, this was temp1.txt. It sets a test file of temp1.txt, but then it creates that text file. The reason there's two tests here is I have found that if you use delayed expansion for file names, in a, for instance, in an echo statement, it does not work. So you have to avoid needing to use delayed expansion here and that means you have to set the T file, the file variable, outside this block. So I set it to temp.txt and I can use it inside the block without having to use the exclamation points for delayed expansion. So what the test uh, code does, it sets the token count to three in case you're working on a project that doesn't have three pieces of information in each file. It sets the delimiter character to comma in case you were working with a, a different format file. It writes four lines to the test file. This creates this one with a single greater than will erase what's there or it'll create a file if there is no file there. So that will create the file and put now is the separated by commas in it. The next line will put 10, 20, 30 also separated by commas. The next line puts out 
three fields separated by commas, and it has some spaces in front of one of the uh, text strings. And then the last one will demonstrate that if you have two separators with no space between them, they are processed as one separator. So the code will think this is the first item, this is the second item, and this is the third item because there's no character between those separators. And in the next project, we'll start with a file that has a lot of adjacent separators and we'll show you a very easy way to fix that problem so that this code can be used to process that file. Some error checking. Make sure the file exists. Now it's really not necessary for this one because it's creating the test file, but if you were using a, if you were developing a project where you had a file up here, it would just make sure that that file exists because the code won't work if, if the file doesn't exist. And if it doesn't exist, it'll just say, okay, the file's not there. And then it'll say, press enter to exit the program. The reason I use a prompt set slash p prompt command is if I used a pause command here, it would have a misleading message. It would just say, press any character to continue. Well, it's not going to continue. It's going to exit. So I, that's why I use this. I don't use the variable junk, but I, this is the format for the prompt line, as we saw in some previous videos. The next code is kind of another error check. It says, oh, you're, if you're not using a delimiter, which means the delimiter is nothing, you can't use anything for the token count except one, because it won't work. If you don't use a delimiter, it reads everything in as one token, and if you try to process more than one token, it will crash the program. So this will give you an error message, says no delimiters, token count reduced to one, and it'll set the token count to one. And this begins the actual search loop. And what the search loop does is, it will prompt the user, there is some debug code here, so if you have that test flag set, it will display the, text, the test file. So you want to make sure the test file doesn't have too many lines in it, because every time it's about to prompt you for an input, it will show you the test file so you know exactly what inputs will test the test file. It does not use delayed expansion for the file name. Remember, it doesn't work in, in, uh, when you do that. When you use uh, commands with the delayed expansion of a text file variable, of a test file variable, doesn't work. So you have to structure it so that you set this outside the loop and then you use standard variable notations inside. Okay, so what this loop does here, it uses a record counter, which it has to set outside the loop, by the way. If you don't set this outside the loop, code doesn't work either. So you set the counter to zero, and now you process all the records in the file, but you read them without delimiters, which means each record will read into one variable, the percent percent %i variable. So then it increments the record count from zero to one for the first one and print, displays the record showing its record and the record number and then the entire record. Remember, that's because we're not using delimiters. If you don't use delimiters and you don't specify tokens, it defaults to one token. And it really has to be one token if you're not using delimiters, as we mentioned. I don't really need that label that was there. That's left over from a code change, so I'll, I'll remove it and save the uh, change to the file. And the one that will be on my website will be the corrected one. Remember how to test this. You can copy the code from my website page and paste it into a batch file, and then you can just execute that batch file to play with the code. To continue, it prompts the user to input the number of the field you want to search. This is some uh, error prevention. If the user accidentally enters any one of these letters, it may cause the program to crash. Uh, for the reason that you can't totally prevent the program from crashing, especially for this type of error with an illegal character, should always make a backup copy of files that you're going to process with the batch file processor. Always make a backup copy so that if you screw up your file, you can 
reload it from the backup. Here's some error checking. Turns out if you enter a normal letter instead of the number or, or a number with a letter like ABC whatever or capital, this test will fail. It'll be greater than the token count and it'll go to bad entry. If you accidentally enter a negative number, like you accidentally had a minus before you entered the uh, number of the field you're going to search, so the number came out negative, that'll also fail this test and it'll go to bad entry. If it passes those two tests, meaning it didn't jump, it goes to check done, it will then prompt you for the value you're searching for. So here's where it goes when it has a bad entry. I do it this way because I really want to avoid nesting ifs. So what it does, the bad entry just says bad entry must be in the range 1, 2, and whatever the token count is. And then it goes to next search. So it'll just reprompt you for, for input of the uh, field of search. So if it passed that test, it goes to check done. Then it says, it checks, did you enter a zero? That's why this test here says if it's less than zero to go to bad entry, it allows a zero. But zero is the way you terminate the loop that's prompting you and searching. And I should go back and quickly mention, in the search loop before the prompt, I set the item number to zero. What that does is, if the user hit just hits return when it's prompting for the uh, field number to search, it will keep that zero. So then that zero will be there and then it will go to quit. The same thing will happen if the user enters a zero at that point. So either one, just hit return or hit zero then return. Then it goes to quit and, and the program window closes and the program exits. Now if, if all those tests are passed and the user didn't ask to quit, then it prompts you for the value to find. And what it's doing here, this is a string replacement command that says take, take what the user entered in item value, look for every space in it and change it to nothing. There's nothing between the equal and the percent. If you wanted to change those spaces to some other letter, you'd put that letter right here. So that strips all the spaces out of the user input of the item value. I do that so that if one of the fields has a leading blank in it or a trailing blank or even if you enter accidentally enter a leading or trailing blank on the uh, value you're looking for it'll still find that value in the file. It'll ignore the spaces anywhere in either the field or in the value you're looking for and it will find it and, I'll, and we'll see in a minute how that works. It just gives you a blank space in your output, separate the uh, output lines. So then it summarizes what, what you're about to do. It says you're, you're searching field whatever number you entered for whatever value you entered and this is without the spaces removed. There's two variables here because well I do want to search with, a very, with the spaces removed, I also want to put out messages with the original value in them. So I keep two variables. Value has the spaces in it. Value 1 has them removed. So it summarizes here what you're doing and, and the spaces are not removed. It shows you exactly what you entered for the value. It does surround them with quotes so you can see exactly what you entered. I set the record count to zero because as I search I'll keep a record count and I can then tell the user what record number it found the value in or I can tell him the last record and how many there were and I can show him that last record. So here's the actual read command that starts the loop to read and search all the records in the file. The format is it's going to read tokens one through however many tokens you told it to read and it's three on my test file so it's going to read tokens one through three it's going to use a delimiter specified by this variable which was set to comma. So it's going to be comma delimited for the test. The way it works, it's reading three tokens. It's going to read the first one into percent percent %i, the second one into percent percent %j, and the third one into percent percent %k. That's the way this for slash f works. There's the file name and it is a standard variable not a delayed expansion variable because a delayed expansion variable syntax does not work here. 
Then there's a block of instructions to execute for each of those records that were read. Remember, we've read three values in. So what it does in, the, in this block, increments the record count from zero to one for the first record. It is delayed expansion. It saves the first value read in variable x, strips the spaces and saves that in variable x1. So I'm keeping two sets because, again, I'm going to show the record later with spaces the user entered, and I'm going to use it without the spaces for the search. And it does the same thing for the second value read. It puts it in y and y1 with and without spaces and the third. I probably could have slightly simplified the logic by using indexed variables, but I had so much trouble with the syntax of indexed variables, I decided not to do it that way. So there's maybe a little bit more code here than there has to be, but I like to avoid problems. So what this does, it says, oh, was, did you want to search field one? If you did, I have to look at x1, because that's where the first field got stored and the space is stripped. And again, that's the user value that he's looking for with the spaces stripped. So if it finds it, it goes to found it, the label. If you weren't searching in the first column, it would look at the second one, and it would use the x, it would use the y value, same test, and the third column would use the z value. And we'll see later how to add more columns to search, even if they're not in order. Because we'll be adding column W in the next video, because that's the, a field we need when we're processing a saved contacts list. And we'll see that later. It's very easy to add that code. You don't need to add the numbers in between. You just need the ones you're actually going to search. So if it goes all the way through here without finding a match, it will say, I did not find that value in that field. It tells you how many records were in the file because it had to read them all to figure out it didn't find a match. And then it shows you the last record read and it puts in the delimiter you're specified to use. These fields are with the spaces still present because that's the way the record looked. At that point, it goes to done, a misnomer, because what that does, it loops for another prompt for the next search. If it did find a match, it goes to found it, and found it says, ah, I found the value in this field, and here's the record it's in. Record count from, from the loop, because we're keeping a record counter, and, and then shows the record that contains the value you found. Then it goes to the next search. So it keeps looping there, as I said, until the user enters a zero, and then it jumps down to quit, and the window disappears, and you're done. Now let's look at how the code works in practice. Since the text test flag is set, it reads and displays the entire test file, and that's this. And now it's prompting for the number of the field to search, and let's just demonstrate how it works. Let's look for now in field one. And there's your message, it found it, and there's the record it's in. And now let's look for CUY in field two. And it found it, and there's the record it's in. I want to point out something, if I haven't pointed it out before. If you don't have a space between your delimiters, it treats it as a single delimiter. So this will wind up as, this is field one, this is field two, and this is field three it treats adjacent separators as one separator, as many as there are. So we'll double check that. I think this will be field two PDQ. Let's look for that. And it, sure enough, it found it as field two. Now to demonstrate that case, the case of the letters does make a difference, there's a capital UIO as the third value in, in this record. So let's look in the third field for capital UIO. Sure enough, it found it. Now let's look for lowercase uio. Did not find it. Case matters. Let's demonstrate some of the error checking. Let's say you accidentally hit a letter instead of a number. It says that's a bad entry. Got to be in the range 1 to 3 and ask for another entry. Let's try like R4. Same thing. 
Now again, some of those special characters will kill the program. So save a backup of the file before you start fiddling with it. And to demonstrate that the program will close when the user just hits return or enter zero, I want to emphasize some of the syntax problems that I ran into and I avoided in the code. I found by trial and error that there were certain problems with the language. I don't use indexed variables because the syntax can get you in trouble. I probably have a video later on how to use indexed variables in very simple code. Uh, variables used in blocks of the four commands I believe need to be initialized in the block in the code group just outside the block the instructions in or if it's say if it's a variable inside of a for command whether or not it's a block you need to initialize that variable immediately in the uh, code that surrounds the for command I believe if you go back more than one level like if you have nested tests it may not work properly and again you would have to use delayed expansion variables if you're going to initialize outside of a for statement or outside of a block in an if or a for statement. Delayed expansion variables again can't be used for file names so you've got to structure your code so that you never use a delayed expansion variable as a file name. They just don't seem to work. Thanks for watching my video. If you like this video, please click my name, Thomas Wallace, to visit my channel page to watch my other videos.